Welcome to the Health Science Podcast, sponsored by the National Health Association. I'm your host, Dr. Frank Sabatino, and today I'm delighted to have as my guest, uh, Monk Coleman. Uh, Monk is a uh, competitive vegan bodybuilder. He's an author, an inspirational speaker, the author of a book called Love Over Fear, which I really want to spend some really nice time talking about with him and has been involved with uh, the impact of, uh, you know, plant-based nutrition and fitness in a very transformative way. Welcome, Monk. It's a pleasure to, to meet you and be with you. Thank you. Welcome to the Health Science Podcast, brought to you by the National Health Association, the oldest organization in the world, championing the extraordinary benefits of a whole plant food diet and healthy lifestyle, as well as water-only fasting. We believe that health results from healthful living and focus on evidence-based science that promotes the health of you and your loved ones, as well as the health of all animals and the environment. We feature experts from a cross-section of disciplines within the plant nutrition, vegan, psychological, environmental, and animal compassion sectors. I'm your host, Dr. Frank Sabatino, the NHA's Director of Health Education. Thank you so much for having me. We you know, know when we, we had to reschedule, so I'm really looking forward to this. Oh, good, 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 good. Yeah. So, you know, when we get started, it's, uh, I, I know the, the purpose of this is for people to get to know you. Mm -hmm. So talk a little bit about, you know, the beginnings of your life and the beginnings of things that provided <clears throat> maybe the aha moments that put you on the road to the transformation that became your life but I know you had a rough start with a number of things like many of us do. So talk a little bit about, you know, what led you at the very beginning to start making the changes that became part of your life later. Yeah. Yeah. I believe we all have a story and there's trauma within that story. And some have a little bit more than others, but um, I was born in 1969 and about three and a half years old, my father passed away. He used to struggle with drugs, alcohol, violence, things like that. And my mom was not, I think she made it to 10th, 11th grade. She wasn't that highly educated. So and there were seven of us kids and uh, we were very poor. So I believe now that you choose how you show up, how you come into this world. And I know that sounds crazy, but everything looking back now was exactly as it should have been. So growing up, I, I also got uh, into religion because we were made to go to church three times a week. So in my very early years, I was already stealing from stores. Um, I was already doing things that you shouldn't be doing at five years old, six years old. Um, I pulled a knife out of my brother when I was six years old, just doing. And at three and a half years old, my father passed away. I struggled with drugs, alcohol, and violence. As a matter of fact, when he met my mother, he had just got out of prison. Hmm. Uh, so that was uh, the trajectory that my life was going. Um, very poor. When I say very poor, I mean very poor. Uh, you know, you have poor people, then you have very poor people. So we started out like that. And... Uh, I started going to church because my mom wanted a better life for us, she, even though it's dysfunctional at home. She tried to make it better by taking us to church. And I was also indoctrinated there. So as your program is being created, so there's mixed, mixed messages going on. So dysfunction at home and then obey these rules and do these things at church. Well, eventually I was fully in with the church. Um, in them informative years, impressionable years, I was just getting fed this information and I was fully on board until I got about to about 17 years old. And then I went from 17 years old, I went from being in church to maybe 18 and a half selling crack cocaine and having a drinking problem already. What and was the, what was, what was the, what was the gap right there? That, that's a really important point. How did you go from that church experience into that street experience? What, what, was, the, what was the provocation for that? Because I was uh, programmed with both of those. I got it. Right? I was programmed with both of those. So I, had, I was a perfect mix between my father and my mother. I was a perfect mix between religion 
and dysfunction. So I lived out that first part. Now I'm living out the second part. And really, I'm really just searching for myself. Um, when I started hanging around with certain people, I felt like I got love that I never, I never had before, like a brotherhood. Right. And then what came with that, I wasn't a very, I was pretty attractive dude back then. So what came with that, the women and the dysfunctional relationships and things like that. So I, for about 20 years, I went down this path thinking something was going to change. Multiple babies, multiple baby mothers, um, a lot of toxic relationships, uh, romantic relationships, as well as other relationships. I started doing things that I knew would send me to prison. And fortunately or unfortunately, I didn't go because at this time, my body, I was abusing my body so much that a trip to prison might have given me a chance to kind of heal up a little bit. Right. So I kept moving from place to place because I knew I was going to go to prison for doing what I was doing. So I, I was changing locations. And then at age 38, I, I realized I was having a baby, another one. At this time, I have five. I was getting ready to have six, 38 years old. Again, every relationship I had was toxic. I cheated on everybody. It was a horrible boyfriend, husband, whatever I was in that relationship, it was my fault. I now realize it takes two, but still the things I was doing was very abusive and not physically, but mentally and emotionally abusive. I knew how to break somebody down. That was one of my gifts. Like if, if, if I can get you to feel what I want you to feel. I know how to manipulate. So at 38, I'm getting ready to take a trip to Miami to go party. That same night, so me and my current wife at the time, we decided that we wouldn't try to get pregnant, but if it happened, it happened. That was about a week and a half before we went to Miami. So when we got there, I don't know why I said, maybe you should check to see if you're pregnant. Just out of the blue, it just came to me. Maybe you should check to see if you're pregnant. She's like, I'm not pregnant. I said, check. It's not going to hurt to check. Cause we, we getting ready to go hard for a solid week. Right. Right. So whatever we're ingesting is going to have an effect if that's the case. So she goes and get the test. It says pregnant. She's like, oh, it must be wrong. She goes back and gets another test, pregnant. So we're all mind blown, right? So th that means she's not going to do any of the partying, but I can do twice as much. So that next night, the next morning, after being up to about 6 a.m. doing my thing, I go get up to use the restroom and I'm urinating blood. This is not what I need right now. First of all, I'm supposed to be in Miami having a great time mm -hmm. and I'm already suffering from uh, anxiety and depression, not knowing it. This is what I'm, this is why I'm self-medicating in the first place. So now this hits me and the whole week I didn't drink anymore because I knew what it was doing. My father passed away from his drinking at age 36. I was 38. Mm. I was, I, I was, I was due to make a payment. And I always tell people that they drink or do drugs. And I work with that demographic as well. It's like the immediate payment is the hangover, but there's going to be a long-term payment. They're going to have to make down the road. There's no question. You're going to have to make this payment. And it doesn't matter. It, it can come in many different ways, but that payment is going to be had. Whatever you do today, you will to have a consequence, whether it's good or bad on the back end. So I was like, oh, it's my turn. Hmm. I didn't know, I did not know how to even take this. This was mind blowing to me. This was the last thing I needed in my life. So I stopped for a week, got back home, maybe stopped for a few more days after I got back home. And then I was like, oh, I should be good now. 
So I started back up drinking. Same result. Still couldn't stop drinking. At this point, I realized I had a problem. I didn't realize I had a problem before this. I was just a party guy. I was doing what everybody else was doing. Well, that's one of the big hallmark signs of addiction, denial. You, you just deny, you deny consequence, you deny the whole dance. Mm -hmm. And you think you're above the law, so to speak, in, in a way. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah, so that's where you were. So it's, so did you pursue finding out if the, what was wrong physically? Did you do any of that at that point? Well, I actually went to the hospital in Miami. But when I got back, I was, when you're in that state, you don't want, you don't want to see nobody. You don't want to hear nothing. You don't want to hear no bad news. You just going to bypass that. Right? So I kept doing it, having the same thing. It got to the point where I was hiding my underwear because there was blood in it and I didn't want nobody. Mm. Knew. I'm the only one that knew. She didn't know. Nobody knew. So I'm suffering in silence over here. So that was my crutch. And now my crutch was taken from, that's what my crutch was. Now my crutch is giving me the problem. Mm -hmm. What I use for a crutch now. Then one day after a party, I had to make a decision. Cause I knew, I knew it was coming for me. I said, after this part, when I got up the next morning with a hangover and feeling the way I was feeling, I was, that's it. I'm not drinking anymore. I said, I don't care what I have to go through. I want to live. I do not want to repeat this cycle. My kids need me. And I always say my last daughter, when she got here was to save me. Mm -hmm. She came here to save me so I can guide her. Well, Monk, let me ask you a question. Cause you went through those 18 years, you know, where you were still dealing with a lot of abuse and that kind of behavior, but you had made a number of children. And a lot of times when you have a child or you have multiple children, they themselves can be a bit of a sobering influence. Why, why did it not have that kind of an impact on you? Why were you disengaged from some of that sobering influence, that love and compassion that usually happens when you father a child or you father children? What was that disconnect for you that still kept you on that path of abuse for 18 years while you made all these beautiful children in your life? Well, the disconnect was, this is how I witnessed it done to myself. Okay. Right. We never had a father in the house at all the whole entire time, except for the three and a half years that he was there before he died. So there was, no, there was no modeling behavior. There's no way to model it. None. And if, right. if he would have still been alive, it would have been the wrong model. Right. Right. So my mother was still having children after my father died. I'm right in the middle, but there was never no man there. I got it. Right. So now you start to hang out with other young men that don't have fathers and we're buck wild out here. We're mm -hmm. doing, ev we're doing everything. We're doing, I'm doing things I never thought I would do in a million years. I'm selling drugs to people that used to help to raise me. I'm doing things that, that I look back on it. It's like, I was so lost in the sauce. So right? your, your last baby girl was the sobering influence basically. Well, it made me ask the question, do I want to live? Right. And, and I, and I did. So on, almost, so she's 15 and I've been clean for over 15 years. So when that happened and I said, I'm, I'm going to stop this. I never went to an AA meeting. I never even, I, that wasn't even on the radar. I'm like, I'm, I'm just going to do this. So for a solid year, I'm still anxious. I'm still depressed. I'm smoking a lot of cigarettes. I, uh, I don't know what to do with myself because drinking was such a big part of what I did. It was like something was missing. And right. now I know that because of all the dopamine that you give yourself, when you quit, it takes a while for your brain to start producing regular amounts of dopamine. So everything is black and white. Right. So I was very depressed for a while and for almost for a solid year. I'm like, life is boring. Life ain't fun. What am I doing? And then meditation came to, mm -hmm. I don't know how, just like the pregnancy thing. I don't know how it came. I don't know anybody that meditates. 
I have, I'm not familiar with it at all. I had to Google it to try to figure out how to do it. And then all I did was start sitting. That's it. My life changed just from sitting down and being with everything that I had going on. The emotional state, the mental state, the physical state, being present with all these things, allowing the body to get into a state of relaxation so it can process things. Once your body's in a state of relaxation, the, the proce processing happens by itself. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that. It's only when we're very anxious or tense or the body is not working the way it should work. And then we start suppressing and we have all this trapped emotion that we don't know about. We have trauma that we don't know about. We have trauma that was passed to us. We have right. things that we haven't processed. And it's just a big trapped ball of trauma and energy that needs to be released. And when I started to meditate, these things started to move mm -hmm. and they started to move in a way where it's physically moving my body. It started to move in a way where I would burst out in meditation. I burst out in tears because all the tears I suppressed, mm -hmm. I knew things were happening, but I didn't know what was happening. It started to rewire the way I think. And you know, and I know the decision-making process that your life is just all the decisions you've ever made, but where does, where do these decisions come from? And why did I make them? It's from the program. I didn't know that back in the day. Why do I keep making the same decisions when I know the result is going to be the same? It's because these are automatic. It's not really the true me making these decisions. Yes, you have to take responsibility for your decisions, but what trauma caused you to make those decisions? Mm -hmm. Like who hurt you? We were quick to judge people about their behavior, but we're, we don't ever ask who hurt you. Are you okay? We go, oh, you should behave better. You don't know if this person was sexually, physically, uh, abused, beaten, grew up in the uh, uh, foster care, had horrible things done to them. If you knew that, you'd be like, you're doing really well. But no, we just judge their actions. When the sad commentary is you really, on some level, start to believe that it's your fault when it's not. And when you internalize that, that whole issue of self-worth only feeds, that lack of self-worth only feeds that addictive process. You know, you were very fortunate because with alcohol, when you stop alcohol, it's one of the worst physical withdrawals. In fact, for many people, they go through such a reactive set of changes that it's almost difficult to do that without many times medication or some kind of treatment because you wind up getting parts of the brain, the transmitters that kick in, they create all kinds of tremor and they can create all kinds of, uh, you know, fits and they can create all kinds of things that happen for people coming off of alcohol. So it was amazing that you were able to do that on your own, just with the power of what you chose to do, moving into meditation and being still and doing what you did. Um, I'm going to take just a very short break, Mark. I'm so interested in your whole dialogue. We're going to just take a short break to hear from our sponsor, the National Health Association. We'll be right back. I'm here with Monk Coleman. We'll be right back. You're listening to the NHA Health Science Podcast. Dr. Frank Sabatino here. Are you ready for an extraordinary adventure that combines relaxation, exploration, and vibrant health? Then set your sails for the NHA plant exclusive cruises. Imagine cruising through exotic destinations, savoring delectable plant-based cuisine, and engaging in rejuvenating activities, all while surrounded by like-minded individuals passionate about health and wellness. These cruises offer more than just a vacation. They offer an opportunity to immerse yourself in the NHA's principles of healthy living. And they rank incredibly high on the ratings of eco-friendly cruise lines. We all know how important our oceans are, and our cruise partner, Windstar, is fully committed to this. Join us aboard our upcoming plant-exclusive cruises and experience the synergy of health and leisure. Delight in gourmet SOS-free meals prepared by talented chefs, attend informative workshops, and enjoy the serenity of the sea, all tailored to nourish your body, mind, and spirit. 
For more details and to reserve your spot on our next adventure, visit healthscience.org and click the link under travel. Don't miss this chance to indulge in a wellness retreat like no other. Elevate your well-being and make memories that will last a lifetime. And remember, your feedback matters. Please take a moment to leave a rating and a review wherever you're listening to the NHA Health Science Podcast. I'm Dr. Frank Sabatino, your host. Now, back to the show. Welcome back to the Health Science Podcast. Uh, I'm here with Monk Coleman, who is going through his story of uh, dealing with his issues of addiction and recovery and moving into the process of meditation, which really was a lifesaver for him. When you were getting into that sense of stillness, that little place of mindfulness that started to develop with the meditative behavior that you were participating in, did that now lead you into wanting to do other constructive things in your lifestyle that now would make you start to adopt eating habits and living habits that you knew now would be in your best interest that could support uh, a better version of yourself. Talk about how that path, how that evolution moved from meditation into who you started to really become this inspirational, transformative person that you are and now having such a positive effect on other people. So how did that start to transpire? Yeah, so it was, you know, year after year after year, I was doing these things and I noticed that I started to look at everybody different. I started to see homeless people without judgment, but just another being that I want to, to help them. I started to cultivate compassion. At the time, I didn't know, but I was being rewired. Day, at, day by day, I was being rewired. So my heart was opening and my head was opening without me really realizing that. And about three years in, I was eating at a restaurant in Oakland and it was a heavy meat-based restaurant like a Black Bear Diner. It's called, what was it? Willow, Willow or something like that. Mm -hmm. Any, anyways, it was a heavy meat-based diner like that. And the only thing that I thought was good on there or looked good on there was this vegetarian omelet. Now, I didn't know what a vegan was. I knew what a vegetarian was, kind of. But I usually, when I get eggs, I like meat with the eggs. But I ordered this vegetarian omelet, with no meat on it. And this is how the universe works. The person I was with, because when you're ready for something, it will be presented to you. Mm -hmm. The person I was with said, are you a vegetarian? just because I ordered that meal. And I was like, yes. And it, it was a surprise to me that I answered the question with a yes. I, I answered with a yes. So after I leave, I'm like, what was that? Oh, wow. <laughs> like, why did I do say that? And, and, the, and the crazy part is I knew I wasn't going to eat meat again after that. It was a knowing. So I started getting on Google going vegetarian. Cause I was like, why did this happen? So I started looking up vegetarian and, uh, uh meditation, the, the, the connection, the correlation between those two things. Then I realized there's a big one. A lot of people that are deep into meditation also don't eat meat. I said, this is it. This is why. I'm moving away. And it said, basically, I was like, you know, why did I do this? It's because even on a subconscious level, I do not want to bring harm to any other living beings. And I said to myself, that makes sense because most everybody on this planet, if they had to kill their own food, they wouldn't do it. Everybody would be vegetarian, vegan. Because no, everybody feels suffering and everybody feels pain. Nobody wants to feel that. So if I went to a restaurant and said, you have to go back out and handle it yourself. Yeah. I'll just have a salad. You know what I'm saying? So that's a, it's going against what I know is wrong. This whole time I've been going, the program had me going against what I knew was wrong. And that's why nobody wants to see that part because inside they know what's wrong. They don't want to see that suffering. You know, it's funny in the criminal justice system in America, people don't know this. There's something they call the link 
And they find that people that do violence, even to domestic animals in a household, are so many times more significantly uh, going to be involved with violent behavior against their own spouse and children. So there is that link, that vibration of violence, that when you get caught up in it, in a certain way, it feeds other aspects of your life. So, you know, one of the real powers of eating in this plant exclusive way is that whole issue of compassion and this, this kind of loving connection with wanting to not be involved with violence. And it's such a powerful force because as you know, we're surrounded by a culture of violence in many, many ways. And so this is really a rebuttal to that. It's really a great response to that. So this was your, this was the aha moment, the beginning of your journey into plant-based eating, so to speak, pretty much at that point. Yeah. So I didn't know what a vegan was at that time. So I was still consuming eggs. I was, wasn't tripping off of milk. I didn't drink milk like out of a cup, but milk's in so many different things. So I, I wasn't worried about that either because I'd never seen any videos or anything before, you know, before up to this point. Right. And then I seen a video on the egg process that blew my mind. Cause I didn't think there was any suffering going on with the egg, the egg industry. And I also seen a video of the milk process that blew my mind. And I just like, I'm, I was just so ignorant. And then once I, 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 I watched those videos, I'm like, Going back to when I became vegetarian, well, if that's the case and it's about compassion, what am I doing? Mm -hmm. Why am I involved in this, involved in this at all? And then it just kept, you know, kept going down the rabbit hole with the clothes you wear and the products you, I'm like, this is crazy. Mm -hmm. How they just, did this sneak it in everywhere. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and even as a vegan, I know I'm not a perfect vegan because you don't, I mean, they put it in everything everywhere. But in my heart, I do the best that I can, that I'm aware of, right? I don't consciously do things that are against what I believe. But at, that, at that point, were you bringing that into the life of your baby girl too? Was that part of your children too at that point? So this is a funny story. So my wife is now vegan and my daughter is too, right? So I come home after this epiphany <laughs> and I told my wife, I said, I'm not eating meat no more. She said, good for you. <laughs> <laughs> you said, cause I'm going to do it. Right. And I co-parented two of my daughter and I didn't want to be that person to be like, I did this. Now you got to do this. At this point I ate meat for 40 something years. Right. So. I just kept doing my thing. My wife accommodated me. She started, you know, made my stuff separate or whatever. And the, the breaking point for me with that is, um, she asked me to make a turkey burger. First of all, there was a whole rib cage in the freezer that was there since the day I moved in, I moved out of my house and moved into hers. Now I'm seeing a rib cage instead of ribs, right? It's, it's just, a, it's different to me now. It's morbid to me now. And then one day she asked me to make a turkey burger for her. So I did, and I had it in my hand, my bare hand. And I'm looking at the blood and I told her, I was like, I can't do that for you no more. Mm -hmm. I can't do that for you more. It, it, it goes against everything that I believe in. And eventually she became vegetarian and then vegan. Um, and then my daughter as well, my daughter, kept asking me, well, why don't you eat meat? And I would just tell her nothing gory or whatever. I'm just saying, cause I don't, I don't want to hurt any beings. She asked me why I meditate and I tell her why I do that. Well, she started meditating and she went back home to her mom and she was sneak sneaking the meat off of her food and got caught. And her mom contacted me and said, what is this? She's pulling the meat off her food. I said, you know what? I, I ain't told her anything, but I'm happy about it. And she goes, she's just doing it because her dad is doing it. So I'm going to go along with this for whatever, for whatever, you know, however long it is till she realizes that's not what she wants. And then, uh, what happens is her mom started doing research. Now her mom doesn't eat meat. 
so the daughter actually turned the mom. The mom didn't turn the daughter. So, and she's still vegan. She was a vegan gymnast and she's now 15. She's, she stopped, at, I think at six years old. So it's like maybe nine years in and she gets it. She's not just doing it to do it. I think some of these kids are really, really come into this reality tapped in. And I believe if we let them be them, the majority of them won't want to eat meat right. or eat animals. And then with her meditation as well, she was really connected to source. So That's that is how that happened. So let's talk about going from there. Now that you, you know, you, you're in this place where you're making these changes, segue into what was the journey into creating the, that work that you did love over fear. And what was the message you were trying to really convey in that journey with that book? Because look, books are information, they're energy, you're generating energy, you're putting it out in the world. What is it you wanted to accomplish with that? So it, it, just like veganism, it just, I wasn't planning on it. So I wrote down these 10 things and I wrote a short little, a short little something about each of these 10 things, very short, 10 things. And I was going to speak on them because I do speaking. And I, and then when I got there, I'm like, nah, I'm just going to speak from the heart. Like I usually do mm -hmm. about a year later. I see a guy on uh, on uh, YouTube, and he said, "What do you bring to your audience when you speak?" And you know, when people go and hear something or someone, it lasts for a little bit, but then it's gone, right? There's not you. You have people that are, are they go to these things three four times a year and they're still in the same place in their life. I said, Hmm, I said, I give them my, my words, my heart, uh, my truth. I give them all these things, but how long does that stay with them? Then it clicked about those things that I wrote down. I said, I'm going to go find those things. I had to go find it and I'm gonna write a book about it. And you know, when you're in alignment and you're really in the flow, things seem so natural. Mm -hmm. And I just started writing and writing and writing and writing. And I'd be writing for three hours and it's not a big book, but you know, it goes, a lot of time goes into even a small book. Absolutely. Writing. Um, I just felt in the zone and that's how that started. And uh, a couple of my friends helped me out a little bit on certain aspects of the book. And it was just, I think that the, the energy, the vibration of the book by itself is just very powerful. Yeah. And you know, when I was looking at the <clears throat> message, the short message of the book that you put online, you talk about that book helping to emphasize the greatness that is what we really are, what the fundamental truth is to our beingness. And so the question I want to pose to you, and I think it's an impression is, why do you need to do that? What really are the factors that disengage us, that separate us from our greatness? What have you discovered? What do you feel about what those factors are? Why do we need to even talk about it? Why don't we a priori just have that sense of, God, I'm a magnificent creation, because that's what we are. I'm an unbelievable creation. I'm connected to the divine. I'm connected to you know, what's, what's real and powerful in this world. So what are those factors that disengage us from our greatness and why love over fear had to even be written? It's very simple because we were told that we aren't. We were, we were told that we aren't that. And then whenever you believe something, when your mind, your brain is forming them in formative years and you start to really believe and that program gets locked in, the unfortunate thing about that is you start looking for evidence of that. So that's all you see. That's where your focus lies. So if I grew up in dysfunction and I seen all these relationships that were dysfunctional, hmm. and I, I, I lived in the poverty 
in the addiction or all I see is that. All I see is what can I, it's not part of my awareness. I'm not seeing it. I believe what I believe because it was given, this information was given to me. And Dr. Frank, the people I work with, they believe the story. That's why they, they're not living the purpose. That's, that's why they're not tapping into that greatness. They're disconnected from their purpose because of that. You know, it's funny because it's not only those dysfunctional things in family, it's all of that dysfunction that's coming in as information around us, like even from medical professions and other voices of authority that are basically saying, you can't be autonomous, you can't be that powerful, you need these interventions, you need these things because you're not that powerful. For example, we know that the human body manifests such incredible power in the process of healing. And part of that power is not always comfortable. It can be in very uncomfortable symptoms, but that's still part of the body's drive for healing. But we're brought up to think that those symptoms are things we need to fight against because we, we're told that they're against the power that we are when in fact, they're the very expression of that power. So you get lost in having to take medication treatments. We get, I call it being disengaged from our own vitality. And so you're talking about the same kind of thing, but it's it's pervasive because it goes past just dysfunctional family. It goes into dysfunctional social and cultural input. And you've got to kind of, in a sense, transcend all of that to get to that place of accepting your greatness and, and the divinity that you are. It's really powerful. So that's a powerful message. Yeah, you're, uh, you're, so, you're so right. You, you, I couldn't have said it any, any better, but you know, it starts in your household and it just so oh, it starts with that family trauma i get that i i'm i'm with you because that happens that happens early on we get that and and, and, and and those patterns are generational too you know it's like you know your dad was one way but i would guarantee you that he was getting those messages maybe from his dad or his grandfather or so, so that becomes almost generational trauma that becomes etched you know into where we are in the present moment and that makes that a little bit difficult, you know, because you got to unravel that in 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 your own in your own dance, you know, in your own journey. And it's not always an easy dance. The other thing that I found uh, before we go on, let me just say this: uh, for if people want to follow more about, you know, what you're doing and and how they can access you and your information, what's the place they need to go to, Monk? What's the what's the location they can find you at? Monk Eternal, one word, dot com. We got it right there. Beautiful. Excellent. Yeah, I want to go into one other thing, because I know you do a lot of uh, inspirational, transformative work with people that you work with. And I know that that's part of what you do in your lectures and in your teaching. And I liked one piece because you talked about the fact that some of the work really involves diving deep into understand the programs that we create that sabotage ourselves. And we know that that is a big part of addiction too. So let me ask you a question. When you're working with someone, what are the kinds of tools you share with them to deal with that self-sabotage? Talk a little bit about how you provide that kind of instruction and care and, and love and compassion in the people you work with. Yeah, so first I have to give them the ultimate truth. It, the ultimate truth is it's not your fault, but it's your responsibility. Okay. That's, that's the ultimate truth. You, you, it's not your fault that you're here, but if you want to do something different, it's your responsibility and it's a lot of responsibility, mm -hmm. right? So everybody is also an individual. So if I feel like I need, this person needs this thing, if they're really leaning towards the mindfulness thing, if they're le really leaning towards the meditation thing, I will, I'll go there with them. Moving the physical body is also a huge form of healing. People don't understand everything's energy. Your body is just energy and there's so many much stuck energy in your body. Stretching, breath work, all these different things. There's nothing I can really tell you that's gonna change you, but there's something that might resonate with that person where they can change themselves. Yeah, but all those tools you're talking about, they definitely raise the vibration. They, they, they affect the energetics 
of the entire story. And we are, after all, we are energy. That's what we are. So the things you're doing are taking someone from a certain place to really a higher vibratory level is really where it's at. And that's where breath and meditation and all of that. So while you can't change them, you can give them the tools for change. And that's really what's happening there in that change of vi the vibratory change that goes on in our lives. And that's powerful. It's beautiful. And, and forgiveness is a huge, huge it's, it's when I, when I deal with a lot of, uh, people struggling with addiction, because a lot of terrible things in most cases has, have been done to, to, to these people struggling. Mm -hmm. And it, there's a lot of mm, blame. There's the, I call it the Trinity in addiction, guilt, shame, and trauma. Yeah. And those three things have to definitely be dealt with. And they're dealt with by that kind of forgiveness. Yeah. And that's, and that's really an important, that's a very powerful and important piece. Forgiving ourselves, forgiving our parents, forgiving all of it so that we can move on. We can get on with the next part of that dance. So I have a mantra that I use that I think is super powerful um, before I start any of my teachings. It is, I embrace where I am and how I feel. Wherever you are and however you feel, happy, mm -hmm. sad, mad, glad, angry, right. I'm going to embrace it. Not just accept it. I'm, gonna, I'm going to embrace it right now. Safe and knowing I am where I'm meant to be to learn, grow, and heal right now. And this is how we start off our, and then we, what two things to keep open, your heart and your mind. Or two things to keep and then we go through gratitude because a lot of times the, the 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 people i work with so much is happening in their life it's hard to see the blessings that they have mm -hmm. so let's take our focus off what's going wrong and let's put it on what are you what are what are the blessings in your life right now mm -hmm. your children your family what what just your breath your health let's put our focus there because whatever we focus on that you're going to give it energy you're going to give that energy to it where tension goes, energy flows. Let's start to shift the way we think about life. And I know it's hard because so much has happened in your life that you're always waiting for something else bad to happen, which is a self-fulfilling prophecy because that's where your energy is. Right. Yeah, that attitude of gratitude is really in a lot of ways where it's at. And because it also leads to that forgiveness and compassion that you're talking about, which is so incredibly powerful. Let's go the next step. Let's talk about, because you have gone the next step of even being a competitive bodybuilder. Uh, let's talk about what that meant to you and how that evolution happened in your life and what led you into wanting to do that. Where, how, how, did, how did your life take you there? Well, and I know, I know you met people like Jeff Palmer and you met people that are really very inspirational people that have been vegan and and they've been doing their thing, but talk about that that journey for you. So I'm about to jump back on the stage in May, <clears throat> but it's funny. <clears throat> I didn't want to be a bodybuilder. Um, I had no intentions on being a bodybuilder. Jeff Palmer <laughs> hit me up on social media, said, how would you like to be sponsored? I was like, what kind of question is that? Of course, I'd love to be sponsored by you. Cause you know, we, I've been, we were been friends on social media. And then he goes, there's a competition in five weeks in Texas. You think you can be ready for that? I think I can be ready for that. That's how it started. That's it. That's how it started. And I just continue to compete. Yeah. So I, as you did that, though, what was the feedback that made you want to continue to compete? What, what was the feeling that was connected to that for you? I mean, to really be honest, I, I, it just really wasn't my thing. Oh, okay. <laughs> it just really was, you know, it just wasn't my thing. But the thing about it is it was giving me a platform. Most people, when they invite me to speak, they want me to talk about bodybuilding. I want to go deeper than that. Bodybuilding is one of the most superficial sports, if that's what you want to call it. Mm -hmm. You're complete. It's completely about, not about your personality, not about your intelligence. It's not about anything else, but how you look and how you present yourself. What gets shallower than that? But it was giving me a platform 
So when people wanted to hear me speak, they thought there was going to be me talking about fitness and the, no, it was, it came, it came, it you're came getting, up. You're getting in there like a Trojan horse. Cause what's happening is they, they think you're going to get one thing and it's like a gateway into uh, taking them into a deep dive. I get it. And it's, yeah. and it's very cool. I get that. Yeah, so I was talking about love and compassion. They wanted me to talk about barbells and dumbbells. I'm like, <laughs> it's way deeper than that. You know what I'm saying? It really, it really is. I can give you a little bit on that, but that's not where I want to focus because you have to understand how precious and how powerful. And if we all do this together, if we all get on this together, this world will change in an instant. Mm -hmm. In an instant, it's so many people out here that are trapped and lost in that program that collectively we are not at a state to where the world's gonna change yet. I believe once we get over a certain point as far as raising the frequency of this planet, then it's gonna change for the better. But when I look at things and the state of things right now is so frustrating to me because I can see all the division and all the programs that cause the division. And I'm just like, even sports, you got people killing each other over a football game. Yeah, I know. That's ridiculous. Yeah. You got people smashing TVs, smashing phones, making I saw, I saw that today, even at that parade for that, the winning Chiefs. You know, I, I can't, uh, it, it's startling to me that you take a positive energy like that and all of a sudden someone's got to take a gun out and start shooting into a crowd. It's just, it's mind blowing to me that that has to happen, you know, and yeah. And yeah. we're not at it. We're not at a point where we could see the the ridiculousness of that for our species as, as a whole, and start generating the vibration and the energy that you're talking about. Because that's really what we have to do. Mm -hmm. And and the vehicle of what you're doing is moving in that direction. So it's it's very cool. It's very powerful and cool. Yeah. So when you and I we look at these things, we can see it clear, but then everybody else is not seeing it. So it's frustrating. And when they talk about, uh, I, I'm a, a Republican, I'm a Democrat, and they just cause people to fight. It's like, you don't see the bigger picture. Right. They want you to fight. They want this to happen. The separation between even belief systems, race, politics, religion. How are you going to fight and kill over religion? That's not computing. Think about this. There's been more people killed in the name of God than for any other reason on planet Earth. Think about how absurd and insane that actually is when God is love. That's what it is. And so, you know, when you think about that, those that divisiveness, that separation you're talking about is what feeds the survival of all the stuff that's keeping that vibration down. And so there's a part of that that comes from fear. We don't want to deal with the change that can lead us into the magic and mystery of the unknown in every moment that we breathe. And that's such an important piece. So what you're doing is so powerful. I love it. You know what, Dr. Frank, you know, at one time I wanted to be this big speaker in front of a lot of people. Right. In this thing, the people that I'm trying to impact, they're not going to be there. Mm -hmm. Those people that, that come to see me talk, those aren't the people I'm trying to reach. The people I'm trying to reach is in the streets. Yeah, right. Yeah, you wind, up, you wind up speaking to the choir, so to speak, and that's oh, what yeah. happens. You know, it happens all the time. Right. They're, 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 they're in survival mode in the streets. Right. They're not saying, oh, let me get a ticket and go to this event <laughs> and hang out and listen to somebody talk. They're right. like, where am I getting my next meal from? Yeah. How am I going to do this? Where my, I don't have shoes, my shoe ripped. How to, and I'm like, I don't want that anymore. I right. don't want it. I told my wife that, and she's like, why not? That's like, so Monk, let me ask you, how do you feel you can reach the people that you need to reach like that? What, what's, on, what's on the horizon for you and how you view what you can do to reach that population of people? Well, when I, since I've been out here in Arizona, what I do and the people I meet are those people. Okay. Right. And when I meet them in the streets, we have conversations. You, well, I, and, and I still have people that I worked with when I first came out here that still hit me up. I will give a stranger my number. I, it, it doesn't matter. Whenever you 
this is what people don't understand. You take your energy wherever you go. People say, how can I change the world? Be the person you came here to be. That's how you change the world. Because your frequency will be so high, you're going to change the energy around you. You can go into any place and completely flip the energy in that room by bringing that love with you wherever you go. When you do that, people come up, strangers will come up and talk to you. They'll come up and ask you questions. There's just something about holding a certain frequency that's attractive. And it can attract people that are hurt. Yeah. And a lot of times it does. I get the the most unbelievable, I have the most unbelievable conversations with people I've just met. We gotta we gotta understand when we when we do these things, we have a we have a responsibility. We have a we have a big for those on the awakening path, but I, I believe it never ends. You just awaken to more truth. For those people that are on that path, they see things that other people, they're red, they're red pill people. They see things that others can't see. Right. When, 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 when some people get triggered by certain things, you see it way different. You see it as something else. You see it as an opportunity. You don't, you, you see it as this is a hurt person and I'm here to help this person instead of this is a, a terrible person. Why are they acting like that? Mm -hmm. But you got to hold your you got to hold your vibration of that vision. That's very important. You know, if you go in a room and you have a bunch of tuning forks, strike a tuning fork and it starts to vibrate. All the tuning forks in that room vibrate at the same frequency. So I learned this early on when I was working with people. If someone's coming to me as a doctor, I'm going to hold a certain vibration because I know by doing that, if I keep that solid and strong, they're going to start vibrating at that frequency without even realizing it. And then they become open to the kind of message and so on that we're talking about because they're already starting to elevate that vibration and frequency. So that's a lot about what you're talking about. As we do this more and more, we get more of these living tuning forks vibrating and just affecting Absolutely. the vibration of the world. And that's important. Absolutely. And I always look back, even though, you know, religion is what religion is. But if you want to look at Christ, right? And it, there's allegories, parables, all these. This right. I'm, I'm not a Christian. I'm not. But there's some messages in there that a couple of them that really resonate with me. So he was so tapped in. And he was such a high vibration that when people came around him, healing would take place. That's right. And, 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 I, and I believe that. You can have a certain energy where healing just automatically takes place. The other part, the other part that I always talk about is the ultimate act of forgiveness. The ultimate, the ultimate realization that who people are when he was on the cross and he said, forgive them. They know not what they do. He's saying, that's not who they are. That is the program. Who they are is that amazing being that they were created as before they got it. When they came in as a baby, this is who they are. It's just pure love, baby, at that point. Pure love. And what they were taught to be is what's doing this to me. Right. So even though they're hurting me in a physical way, I know that's not them. Yeah. And so that Monk, is powerful. Yeah. So Monk, as we kind of wind this down, can you want to have any final words you want to share with this audience out here? Well, my word, uh, my words all the time is, it's really about love. It's about keeping your heart open, no matter what. It's not an easy thing to do, but it's, you, it's possible. Right. No matter who tries to hurt you or what's going on to leave that, that's your life force energy. That's, this is the most important thing that you got going. And when you get the coherence going on and you get the mind and the heart and they're on the same page and they ain't arguing back and forth, you are powerful. Mm -hmm. You are powerful. It's always been about love. That's my wife used to call, call me the professional spreader of love because when you, <laughs> When you start to 
the awakening process, you realize the one that, oneness of it all. And then everybody is deser deserves love and essentially is love. Right. I'm going to match that energy with you. We're going to open our hearts together. This is why hugs are so powerful. People don't understand why hugs are so powerful. It's because you're putting your life force energy against someone else's. And it's a transfer of this love energy. The first thing we do automatically without thinking, when we see someone we know hurt, even a stranger, we go in for a hug. And we do that automatically because we know that just love is going to help them. We don't even know why we're doing it, but our first thing is to bring it in, bring it in. Let me, let me give you some of this love that I have right now. I see you're struggling, but yeah, it's always love. It's always going to be about love. God is love. You are love. You are just, I always say, if, if, if God is the sun, then you're a sun ray. If you work yourself back to it, you part of God. And I'll end it with that. Well, I can't thank my guest, Mark Coleman, enough today for sharing his heart, his story, and the message of love that is really what it's all about. And I urge you to follow him. We have his location in the show notes. You can follow Mark Monk, find out more about what he's doing, and to take advantage of this incredible inspirational message that he shares. And I want to thank all the people that joined us today, because without you, we can't do what we do. And I want to really thank you for being part of this really active, healthy community. And on behalf of the National Health Association, I'm your host, Dr. Frank Sabatino. And I look forward to being with you on the next episode of the Health Science Podcast. Thank you so much. You've been listening to the Health Science Podcast, brought to you by the National Health Association. Thank you for joining us today and for your commitment to evidence-based health science that backs a whole food plant exclusive lifestyle and contributes to the well being of all people, animals, and our environment. I'm your host, Dr. Frank Sabatino. Be sure to leave a rating and a review, and we'll see you on the next show.